Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good afternoon, welcome to the 48th lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. In our last lecture, we looked at the various forms of ownership starting from sole proprietorship through partnership, cooperatives, private limited companies public limited companies, section 25 companies and franchises. So, we had seen what are the different characteristics of each of these forms of ownership. Today, we shall talk about the different procedures and steps that are required to start a new company and also we shall discuss about small scale industrial undertakings and the provisions for these small scale industrial undertakings in our country. So, first we shall devote some time on the steps and procedures for starting a new company. Now, there are various activities before one can start a new company, but the important activities are the following, making a plan, creating a business plan basically and deciding which product or service the company will be engaged in, that is making a product choice setting up infrastructure, then the legal procedure naming and registering a business, choosing a form of business organization, choosing where the industry will be located, pricing the product, other regulatory requirements particularly environment, financing a startup business, sourcing processes, raw materials, machinery and equipment and hiring human resource. So, these are some of the important activities that are required to start a new company. Let us see one by one, let us talk about them. When we have a business plan, what are the different paragraphs? The first is the cover page that should mention the company's name, address, telephone number, fax number email and website address, the name and designations of the contact persons, names of the funding organizations and also the company's logo. So, these are expected on the first few pages of a business plan followed by this will be followed by table of contents where the title of each section along with the section number should be mentioned. That will be followed by an executive summary 
giving summarized information on the kind of business, profile of the company's management, financial requirements, budget allocation, objectives of the company both quantitative and qualitative, some market analysis and the influence on environment. These are the summarized information to be given in the executive summary. It can go for one or two pages. This should be followed by a detailed exposition of the actual plan. The development and production in this details of the stages of development and production of the products and services that the company is trying to engage itself in must be given and how at each stage money will be allocated, how long it will take to achieve the objective of each stage, this should be spelled out in detail in this particular section or paragraph. Next, the resource requirement, resource requirement for maintaining quality, for marketing the product and service, to target the market, the communication strategy including advertising, branding and packaging, sales forecast, financial plans, human resources, the form of business, critical risks that are expected to be faced, conclusions and appendix must be mentioned there. And one should be very careful about the format of a plan and its presentation. It should be properly written and it must be edited before the plan is submitted or circulated or given outside. So, these are different headings in which the plan should be mentioned. Making a product choice is a very important aspect of the plan. Naturally, an entrepreneur has to scan for the opportunity in the market, carry out a strong market survey, analyze the competition and make a profitability analysis. Then only the product should be selected. Normally, a number of alternatives are surveyed or rather are explored and the profitability analysis is made on each of the product alternatives to finally decide which product the company should manufacture. Now, there is a reserved list of products for small scale sector in India. Reservation of products for exclusive manufacture in the small scale sector. Of course, the large and medium units can also manufacture such reserved items provided they undertake to export 50 percent or more of their total production then they can also pick up these products. The products are pickles and chutneys, bread, mustard oil, groundnut oil, wooden furniture and fixtures, exercise books and registers, wax candles, laundry soap, safety matches, fireworks, agarbatti glass bangles, 
steel almira, rolling shutters, steel chairs and tables, steel furniture, padlocks, stainless steel utensils and domestic utensils made of aluminum. Now, these products are exclusively meant for small scale se sector. Of course, the large and medium units can manufacture them provided they export at least 50 percent of their production. This is the reserved list of products. Now, setting of infrastructure means land and construction of building. So, how much land is required keeping future expansion in mind and buildings also details of that should be given. What sort of water and power connections are required where from they would be procured that also should be mentioned they are the utilities. Telephone and internet connection about that also the plan should make a mention. <coughs> now, naming and registering a company. Incorporation of a company is governed by the Companies Act 1956. We already have discussed about this. The act is administered through the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, MCA, Ministry of Corporate Affairs and the offices of the registrar of companies that are located in different states and union territories and other such government institutions. Now, the registrar of companies controls the task of incorporation of new companies that means, formation of new companies and the administration of running the companies is overseen by the registrar of companies. For registration and incorporation of a company, an application has to be filed with the registrar of companies. So, every new company has to file its application with the registrar of companies in that state. Application for registration of a company is accompanied by the selected names that is name of the organization, memorandum of association and articles of association and other such necessary documents that are required to apply for the registrar of companies and they must be located in the state in which the company is proposed to be incorporated, meaning its head office will be stationed. Now, what is the meaning of memorandum of association? In a memorandum of association, the name of the company, the place where the registered office will be located, the objectives of the company whether the liabilities are limited it must be properly mentioned and what is the total authorized capital to come from the owners that should also be mentioned and name and address of subscribers and the number of equity shares held by each must also be mentioned. So, these are the contents of the memorandum of association. In the articles of association, different rules and procedures for the routine conduct of the company, for example, how selection of directors will take place, how often the boards will meet and various other things should be mentioned in the articles of association. Memorandum of association can go up to 5 to 10 pages, whereas articles of association can run to 50 from 50 to 100 pages, detailing all the rules and procedures that should guide the routine conduct of the company affairs. 
Now, for procedure for incorporating a company, first is that the name of the company has to be approved by the registrar of companies. If it is a private company, then the last two words have to be private limited. Whereas, if it is a public company, the last word has to be just limited. The word public is not required to be mentioned. Within six months of approval of the name, the memorandum of association and the articles of association must be submitted. Once these are submitted, the register of companies goes through these documents and if they are satisfied, then they give, it gives the certificate of incorporation. That means, now it can start the business. A private company can immediately start the operation upon receiving the certificate of incorporation from the registrar of companies. A public company, however, as the name indicates, has to get money from the public by issuing shares. So, what it has to do? It has to first submit a prospectus to the register of companies and raise capital from the capital market before starting its operation. So, it has to submit a prospectus about the company to the registrar and then give publicity to its desire and can issue shares to the public and can raise money or funds from the capital market or it can submit also a statement in lieu of prospectus and start its operation thereafter. So, this is the procedure for starting a company both private and public. Then of course, the location of the industry we have already discussed about the plant location factors. So, naturally considering those factors the region where the, the new enterprise will be located and exact site where it will be located that must be stated in the plan. Pricing the product we already have discussed lot of things on costs and profits and all other, all other things. So, those things have to be considered to one has to first determine the demand of the product, estimate costs and profits, determine the competition, consider the governmental regulations and select a method of pricing. And there are certain essential certain commodities under the essential commodities act which we shall discuss just now whose price where prices supply distribution production and all that are controlled by the government. So, one has to keep it in mind if the, the product is one of the essential commodities then the government's guidelines regarding prices have to be followed. Then price monitoring cell in the department of consumer affairs reports on daily and weekly basis retail prices daily and wholesale prices and also on a weekly basis also. So, this also give an idea as to what the pricing, what the prices of the product could be. Now, as I said there is a list of essential commodities where the government will have the power to produce, supply, distribute and even, and even decide on the price of these items. What are they? In India, they are cattle fodder, including oil, cakes, and other concentrates, coal, coke, and other derivatives, parts and accessories of automobiles, cotton and woolen textiles, drugs, certain amount of foodstuff, including edible oil seeds and oils 
iron and steel including manufactured products of iron and steel, paper including newsprint, paperboard and strawboard, petroleum and petroleum products, raw cotton either ginned, unginned and cotton seed, raw jute, jute textiles, fertilizer whether inorganic, organic or mixed, iron made wholly from cotton, seeds of food crops, fruits and vegetables, cattle feeder, fodder and jute seeds. So, these are the essential commodities whose pro production, supply, dis distribution and pricing is are done by the government. Now, there are certain regulatory requirements for every company before it can start. One is the Companies Act which we have already discussed, but there are other regulations particularly with regard to environmental protection. Every aspect of environment protection like air, water, noise, forest conservation, wildlife protection etcetera are governed here. Also there are separate laws for emission of hazardous wastes. So, the company must ensure that it does not violate any of these provisions, regulatory provisions and get certificates before it can start. Ministry of Environment and Forest is the nodal agency for regulating all such environmental aspects and this pollution control board in each state his head office is central pollution control board, but it has offices in different states they are called state pollution control boards. They ensure central pollution control board actually has set standards for air, water, solid, noise and also hazardous waste pollution and the state pollution control board ensures that these standards are actually met by the companies. Then financing a startup business, we shall take up this uh, particular aspect of starting a business in our next lecture, completely in the next lecture we shall discuss financing. So, we are not discussing it here. Sourcing of process raw materials, machinery and equipment. So, first of all one has to first select, decide and select then imports are regulated by Foreign Trade Act 1992. If they are to be imported, then one has to go through this exercise. And uh, of course, there are 30 MSME, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Institutes and 28 branch MSME Development Institute, formerly they were called SISIs set up in state capitals and other industrial cities all over the country who help in deciding or who help in telling uh, what the process requirements are, what the raw material requirements are, which machines will be required, which equipment uh, are required to manufacture the products. They have specific guidelines and they can also give help, but the decision as to from which supplier to buy is purely on the manufacturer who is deciding to buy them. Lastly, hiring human resource and that is very important, planning for people, recruiting them, selecting and actually using them. So, these are different aspects of a business plan. So, before one makes or starts a business, he has to make a thorough plan as to how the business will actually function, what product it will make, where from uh, the, the uh, where it will be located, 
and different regulatory provisions whether it is meeting, money where it will come from. So, these are different aspects that are required before it can actually submit the memorandum of association and articles of association to the registrar of companies and then it gets certificate of incorporation and then if it has sufficient capital it can start the business if it is a private company. If not it has to submit a prospectus or a statement in lieu of prospectus before it can actually issue shares to the capital market get capital out in the from the capital market and start its business. So, these are the procedures and steps required for starting a new company. Now, we see to the next we go to the next topic which is small scale industrial undertakings. Now, particularly in India we would like to know what are the different types of small scale industrial undertakings, how they are defined and these are the things that we would like to study under this topic. So, small scale industrial undertakings. An industrial undertaking in which the investment in fixed assets in plant and machinery whether held on ownership terms on, on lease or on higher purchase if it does not exceed rupees 1 crore then that industrial undertaking is a small scale industrial undertaking. So, basically it says that if the investment in plant and machinery. So, these are the keywords investment So, we already know that plant and machinery are the fixed assets. So, investment and fixed and uh, in investment in plant and machinery if it does not exceed rupees 1 crore for an industrial undertaking then that industrial undertaking is designated as a small scale industrial undertaking. Further these are the other things that should be kept in mind the unit must not be owned or controlled by or be a subsidiary of any other industrial undertaking. So, it should not be controlled or owned by some other person nor it should be a subsidiary of a bigger company then and also it should have the investment less than 1 crore then it is a small scale industrial undertaking. In calculation of the value of plant and machinery the original prices are to be taken and other costs such as cost of transportation, installation, cost of tools, jigs they are to be excluded. So, the original prices are taken and not the second hand prices. In case of imports, the import duty, shipping charges, custom clearance charges and sales taxes are to be included in the calculation of the investment in the plant and machinery. So, these are certain overriding rules to define whether an industrial undertaking is small scale. Now, we have ancillary industrial undertaking. An ancillary industrial undertaking manufactures and supplies parts, components, sub assemblies, tooling or other intermediates or renders services of not less than 50 percent of its production or services to one or more other industrial undertakings. That means, if an undertaking provides service or supplies parts etcetera 
to one or more number of industrial undertakings exclusively at least 50 percent of its total production, the other the remaining production or services it can sell on its own to various other place things, but to specific industrial undertakings if it sells at least 50 percent of its products or services then it will be called an ancillary industrial undertaking. Then micro enterprise are also known as tiny enterprise. Here for a uh, we have already seen that for a small scale industrial undertaking the investment should uh, should be does not exceed 1 crore that means it is less than 1 crore. But for a tiny or micro enterprise it should be less than only 25 lakh if it produces goods and it could be less than 10 lakh if it renders services it will be then a micro enterprise. Now, another type of small scale industrial undertaking is small scale service and business enterprise. Here the investment in plant and machinery for manufacturing if it if it produces goods should be between 25 lakh and rupees 5 crore. Then it is called a small cell service and business enterprise or if it is rendering services then its investment in plant and machinery could be between rupees 10 lakh and rupees 2 crore. Then also we define medium scale enterprise. A medium scale enterprise is defined as an enterprise where the investment in plant and machinery is between rupees 5 crore and rupees 10 crore if it produces goods and it is between rupees 2 crore and rupees 5 crore if it renders services. So, a medium scale enterprise is basically the investment is between 5 crore and 10 crore if it produces goods or if it is if it renders services then its investment in plant and machinery should be between rupees 2 and 5 crore. Then also we define export oriented unit. A, an, uh, an enterprise is designated as export oriented unit if it exports a minimum of 30 percent of its production by the end of third year of production. So, which means minimum 30 percent of its production if it exports and that should be achieved by the end of the third year then it will be designated as an EOU export oriented unit. Then a woman entrepreneur is one who manages a small scale industrial unit or who has a share capital of not less than 51 percent as partner, shareholder or director of private limited company or who is a member of cooperative society such a person is called a woman entrepreneur. 
make it uh, singular. So, a Oman entrepreneur is one who manages a small scale industrial unit or who has a share capital of not less than 51 percent as partner, shareholder or director of a private limited company or who is a member of a cooperative society. C is termed as a Oman entrepreneur. Now, we have SIDBI, Small Industries Development Bank of India, set up by the government of India in the year 1990 for promotion, financing and development of MSME sector. MSME stands for Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Sector and for coordinating the functions of other institutions engaged in similar activities. So, this is the apex institution set up by the government of India and it can actually fund to start the business depending on whether you are designated as a ancillary industry or a small scale industry or a medium enterprise or a micro enterprise it can help funding the starting of the enterprise. It also has different other activities. The activities of SIDB, the Small Industries Development Bank of India are the following. Setup of new projects, it helps you to tell what are the different projects that one can engage in expansion, diversion, modernization, upgrading technology, quality improvement, rehabilitation of existing units, this can be, these are also done. Strengthening of marketing capabilities of SSI units, development of infrastructure for SSIs small scale industry basically SSI stands for small scale industrial units, small scale industries and of course, for export promotion. So, these are different activities of SIDB. Now that we have seen how to start a new company and the different forms of small scale industrial undertakings and how SIDBI, the apex institution set up by the government of India helps in promoting small scale enterprises. And because we still have a few minutes left, let me start the discussion on how to get capital finance for starting an enterprise and for continuing the activities of an enterprise. Thus, the next topic which I thought I should start in the next lecture, I am actually going to start now and that is capital financing. Thus, capital financing is the topic that is a new topic that I am going to start now and I think I briefly mentioned at the time of discussion on how to start or the steps of starting a new enterprise that there was a slide on capital financing which I did not discuss. I said that we will start in the next lecture, but I am going to start it now right now because we still have about 10 minutes left with us. Thus, the topic is capital financing. <clears throat> now, for an enterprise, there are two types of financial units. One 
the fixed capital need and the other working capital need. Now, what is fixed capital need? The funds required to purchase fixed or durable assets are known as fixed capital, also they are known as long term capital. The fixed or durable assets that require this fixed capital include land, buildings, machinery, equipment and furniture. All that these items were included in the fixed assets when we discussed the balance sheet. Also in the balance sheet on the asset side we had current assets. Now, money invested in short term assets also known as current assets is known as working capital. What does it include? It includes purchase of raw materials, payment of wages and salaries, rent, fuel, electricity and water, repair and maintenance of machinery, advertising etcetera. Besides the accounts receivables that is sale of goods on credit leads to holding of debtors balance and bills receivable that are also included as current assets in the balance sheet. So, these are the two principal needs of finance to finance building up of the fixed capital to finance the working capital needs. Now, depending on the basis of period of use also we can divide capital into three types long term capital, short term capital and medium term capital. Long term capital is required for period usually greater than 5 years and all the fixed assets that we talked about land, building, machinery etcetera they are required for long term capital and also in the working capital there may be a need to permanently a permanent part of the working capital is also included in the long term capital. The important sources of such long term capital financing are issue of shares, issue of debentures, loan from financial institutions and reinvestment of profits. We shall discuss on each of these issues in our later slides. Short term capital is usually required for a shorter period between is less than one year and they are required to finance the current assets and to meet the day to day expenses such as wages etcetera. And important sources of short term finance are firstly banks, credit that means pay later or pay in installments. These are the ways to finance short term capital needs. Now, this is less than one year and long term capital is more than five years. So, between two to five years the capital needs are usually called the mid term capital. They are required for such activities like renovation of buildings, modernization of machinery, heavy expenditure on advertising etcetera and their source of sources of short term finance, I am sorry this should be medium term finance.
to finance this need, this is same as the long term sources such as shares, debentures, loans from financial institutions or reinvestment of profits. Now, there are two principal sources of funding the capital needs. One, the ownership capital, two, the borrowed capital. Ownership capital means the capital collected from the owners of the company and usually it is used for long term financing for permanent capital or long term capital. The other is borrowed from financial institutions or banks and that is called borrowed capital. Also they are made by raising loans from public or from financial institutions etcetera. Now, let us study these separately. So, broadly therefore, the ownership capital and the borrowed capital can be grouped separately. The ownership capital is normally called equity and under equity we have three types. One is the equity capital, so called the common stock, the preferred stock and internally generated funds which is the retained earning and depreciation which is a non cash flow. This we have discussed earlier. So, retained earnings plus the depreciation they are internally generated funds also known as internal accruals and also we have capital equity capital and preference capital. These constitute the ownership capital. The borrowed capital can be called debt. Under debt we have different forms of debt, debentures or bond, term loan, deferred credit, fixed deposit, working capital advances and miscellaneous. Now, let us uh, uh, before we go further, let us understand that equity capital and preference capital and issue of debentures etcetera, they are issued by the company and they are called securities. So, equity shares, preference shares and debentures are called securities. So, let me put this one instead of here, let me put it here, there is more that is correct. Not everything coming under debt are securities, it is the bonds or debentures that are securities. Now, under what conditions equity is preferred? Now, here the tax rate is negligible, the business risk whenever business risk is high, equity financing is preferred. Here as the number of shareholders increases, the control is diversified, many people are owners therefore, control is not restricted, but if such restriction is not very important then equity preference, equity financing is preferred. Also if financing is required for intangible assets, then equity financing is important. Also if the project for which the equity is required has many valuable growth options, we go for equity financing. So, these are the conditions for which equity capital is preferred.
Now, as we know capital can be raised from the capital market from the public or through a or from a small set of uh, private uh, number of people. Accordingly, they are called public capital or private capital. Public capital is raised through securities that are offered to public through an offer document which is filed through CB. CB is Securities Exchange Board of India that controls offerings of stocks to the public and they are traded in public through secondary markets such as national stock exchange and Bombay stock exchange NAC or BSC. So, when capital is raised from the public this has to be done through SEBI from the primary market or it can be traded in the secondary market through NAC or BAC. Private capital is raised through loans from banks and financial institutions or by issuing securities to a small group of investors like private equity funds, venture capital firms, financial institutions, insurance companies, mutual funds and wealthy individuals. So, friends in today's class first of all we gave the various steps and procedures that are required for starting a company. There we mentioned that raising finance to start a company is a very, very important step and we said that we would start that topic in the next lecture. Then we discussed about various forms of small scale industrial undertakings, but we found that there are there is some time left. Therefore, we started the discussion on how to raise finance and the last 10 minutes we discussed about raising finance. Basically, there are two principal sources. One is the ownership capital and the other is borrowed capital and slowly we shall discuss the various facets of both the types of capital financing. So, in our next lecture we shall discuss thoroughly on different forms of capital financing. Thank you very much.